My name is William Welch Wilhelm, and uh, I was born in Illinois, in McDonough County near Macomb, Illinois, M-A-C-O-M-B, and I uh, was, uh, that was the 25th day of February, 1922. Makes me 85 today. And uh, I grew up there. My, we lived right in, the, on a farm actually, in the farm country. But my dad was not into farming. He was an automotive mechanic and had his own garage there and serviced all the cars within about a 10 mile radius, I think. And uh, the tractors out in the field, he made, uh, where doctors uh, make house calls, he made field calls on tractors and worked on them. I've gone with him many times. And so I grew up in his automotive repair shop, and this plays a, an important part uh, later on. My father's name was William, uh, William B. Wilhelm, and my mother was Lenore, formerly Lenore Welch. I went to a little one-room country schoolhouse a mile and a half away through mud roads. Uh, there wasn't even any gravel on those roads. They did, yeah, they'd invented gravel by that time, but it hadn't uh, gotten around to that place yet. <laughs> Let's see. Well, I went to high school. I was a year late starting to high school. I went to high school in Industry, Illinois, a little town three miles, four miles south of us there. And uh, now uh, getting around to where I was when... World War II began, and that was when the Japanese force hit Pearl Harbor unexpectedly. And uh, I had already uh, left home and gone to, I was living in St. Louis at the time, and had a job that uh, my uncle had gotten for me. Uh, I was a steam fitter welder's helper at the time. And I uh, learned uh, a lot about welding. I did a lot of welding that uh, was not critical welding that uh, he was, uh, would have normally done, but he let me do it because I was going to extensive welding schools. At night, I went two nights a week and uh, learned just about everything there was to learn about mostly arc welding. And so I became a very good arc welder, which also plays a part in what I'm going to tell you later. So when uh, the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, I was working on, which was at that time, the largest powerhouse in the world at the end of the McKinley Bridge away from St. Louis across the river into Illinois, right there at the end of the bridge at Venice, Illinois. And I was helping the welder. We were on top, at the very top of that powerhouse. And uh, he had some welding that uh, he needed to catch up on. And he said, Bill, he said, you can do this stuff. He said, why don't you go ahead and catch up on this stuff? for me, and he said, I've got to run down a couple of floors or three. We were quite a few floors up, actually. And uh, he said, I've got to go down and talk to somebody down there about something, and uh, which isn't important. But he left, went down there, and I got my work done. And I thought, my gosh, isn't he ever coming back? And he uh, came back about an hour after he had left, which I didn't expect he'd be gone that long. but. Uh, he said, uh, Bill, he said, uh, we're at war. I said, what are you saying? And he said, the Japanese have just attacked Pearl Harbor and destroyed a lot of our uh, service personnel and our uh, ship's equipment. Uh, you know, they have made a raid over there. And I said, where in the hell is Pearl Harbor? And he said, well, it's right uh, next to Honolulu over in Hawaii. And I said, oh, okay, now I get the picture. But anyway, are you, you can't be serious. And uh, he said, yes, I'm afraid I am serious. He said, this is uh, more serious than you think. And you're going to hear a lot about it later. They're all talking about it down below there. 
So uh, now this was on a Sunday, and uh, we were working because we were putting in a lot of over overtime. It was critical that we get that powerhouse done at a certain time. And so we were putting in all the overtime we could, and uh, there we were working on a Sunday the day that that happened. So I'll never forget being up on top of that when I got the news that Pearl Harbor was hit. <coughs> I, at the time, had planned on going with a friend to California. He wanted me to go, and we were just about through with our part of that project. And so, well, that would be another adventure. I'd like to try that. So I wrote a letter to my mom and dad. Uh, telephoning wasn't as uh, simple as it is today and uh, told them that I was going uh, to California. And I hadn't seen them then for oh, several months, but I was on good terms with them and everything. My mother wrote a letter back immediately and said, Billy, don't go. Please don't go to California. Please come home. And uh, she said, now with this war going on, she said, chances are both you boys, I had a younger brother two years younger than I, be going into the military. And so she said, I want you to be home as much as you can between now and then, so plan on living at home, if you would, please. And uh, so I wrote back to her immediately, and I said, Mom, I will be home. And uh, in a, a few days, gave her a date on it, and which I did, and I lived there for a while. And I, uh, from the beginning, thought, you know, that is really a folly for Japan to attack America, come on. I mean, I don't think so. I don't think this is going to go anywhere. I think it'll be over in uh, a couple of weeks, <laughs> maybe a month at the most. And uh, surely they, uh, they can't go up against a fortification like we have. And uh, with everything I knew about Japan was uh, made of balsa wood and a tissue paper like the model airplanes that I built and things like that. And I didn't have a very good opinion of their ability. So I figured, well, this thing will be over soon, so I'm not going to just jump into this immediately. I'm going to wait for it to get over with. Well, first thing you know, I uh, months went by, and I uh, went back uh, to Moline, Illinois, where my dad and mother lived. At the time, they had moved up there. When the war started, my dad wanted to do what he could for the war effort, so he went to work at the Rock Island Arsenal, which is adjoining um, Rock Island and Moline, uh, adjoin each other across the river from Davenport. I uh, went to work there for a while, actually at the Rock Island Arsenal, uh, working in a machine shop. And I had worked in a machine shop there at St. Louis at one time before I, I did all this extensive welding uh, stuff for oh, about two years on that, actually. So here I am now, and uh, there, uh, up there, and the war is still going on. And I see guys all around me going in, and uh, they're getting drafted, and I'm registered for the draft, but uh, nobody has called me. And I thought, well, uh, you know, this war is progressing, and uh, I didn't expect that at all. So I think it's about time I do something. Somebody's got to fight this war. What am I going to do? Wait for them to draft my mother, and she's going to fight the war? I don't think so, because I'm an able-bodied boy. <laughs> and so I, uh, well, I see a lot of them going in the Navy and going into the Army. And I didn't know anything about the Marine Corps, hardly at all. I was riding my motorcycle one day down past the post office, and there's a big silver and blue banner blowing in the breeze. It says, join the U.S. Marine Corps and see the world. And I thought, well, you know, uh, that uh, might even get me out of the draft. <laughs> I uh, parked the bike and went in and talked to the guy. And uh, gosh, he showed me pictures of beautiful sandy beaches, you know, and 
palm trees and dancing girls. And I said, oh my gosh, where do I sign, you know? So <laughs> first thing you know, I've signed up for the Marine Corps. Well, uh, when you go into the military at a time like that, it isn't a matter of when are they going to call you. They tell you right then it's like two days and then you better get your act together, you know? So I remember my mom and dad and my brother and my little sisters uh, taking me to the train depot and I rode the Burlington Zephyr train from Moline to Chicago on the 23rd day of September that year. And uh, in Chicago I was sworn in the next day the train was bound for uh, San Diego for boot camp for training. So uh, I was on that train for I think four days going cross country and it stopped for just seemed like about everything. And it was so boring sitting on that train. I didn't have enough sense to take uh, along a lot of reading material or anything and I sat there looking at everybody else that's involved in card games and uh, the, the train is full. There one day I was so bored with riding in that coach. Now I have nothing against gambling. I, I just don't care to get involved in it because it just isn't something that I, that I like to do. And uh, I don't care who gambles around me and I put a quarter in a slot machine once in a while or something like that. But other than that, I don't really care for it. So I was bored and so I walked <coughs> through that train and I thought, uh, and I much cursed as I walked through uh, crap games going on on the floor and I'm stepping around them and through them and uh, they don't appreciate that at all. And So I found myself, after as uh, far as I could go on this train, I don't know how many cars there were, there weren't many, but uh, I got up clear up to the coal car and I'm looking out through the end of this coach that I'm on to, at the coal car and I thought well now you know the engine is beyond that coal car and uh, that'd be interesting you know to uh, keep on going so you know I climbed up over that coal car and I'm up there on top of this pile of coal and I kind of got overbalanced and I slid down the I still was on my feet, but I slid down that coal, and the fireman who was scooping that coal in didn't appreciate that a bit, and he uh, looked at me like he was going to hit me with a doggone shovel, you know. <laughs> so I looked, and I saw the uh, engineer in the back of this cab as we were rolling along. Uh, he got a kick out of that, and he... <laughs> motion for me to come down there so I went into the back end of the cab and he said uh, what are you doing here and I said well it was so boring uh, you know riding in this uh, back there in the coach and I thought I'd see what uh, how this all works up here and he said well good he said I need somebody to talk to anyway we couldn't talk very had to yell at each other actually with all that noise and I forgot to mention the cinders that uh, uh, are blowing as you come over a coal car like that. You get a face full of cinders, you know, and I'm already from the coal and the cinders, I'm uh, pretty dirty. So I uh, talked with him a while. He said, how would you like to drive a train? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. Like, what you mean? He said, sit down there. And all he had for a seat was a board stretched across there. It wasn't very luxurious, you know. And uh, so I sat down on that board, and he said, now just look out that window. And he said, uh, actually, he said, it just drives itself. He said, there's nothing to it. And he said, it's all set, so he, all you have to do is just sit there in my seat. So I did. And I watched the uh, trees go by, and there weren't many trees. We were in Texas, actually. And so I, <laughs> we're approaching Abilene, Texas, and... Uh, I remember it well. Uh, there was some uh, people there butchering uh, beef as we pulled in uh, right along beside the track. We uh, saw that. And before, though, before we pulled into there, uh, he told me that when I see a sign 
or just a W on the sign. So I said, uh, let him know. And uh, so I did, and uh, I said, there's the W. We just passed it, and he said, okay. He said, now there looked like an old cotton clothesline rope stretched up. And he said, pull that two long blasts. And so I did, and that blew the whistle on that train. And that is quite a sensation to sit in a train and actually blow the whistle on that, but I did. Just for, because of my adventurous soul and my <laughs> boredom back there. So anyway, that was uh, quite an experience. And uh, as we pulled into Abilene, why, uh, we stopped there. And uh, so I went back. And the guys uh, said, how did you get so dirty? And I said, you know, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. And I'm not even going to tell you. <laughs> so that's my adventure that I remember on the way to San Diego. Now we get to San Diego. And it's before, well, it's about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. And so they haul us in a truck to uh, the base from the train station. And there we are met by the drill instructor who's going to, our soul is going to belong to him for the next seven weeks of our severe training in boot camp. We are getting off that truck and we are met by a corporal whose name is Dodson. Now he is going to be our drill instructor and he met us there uh, not very pleasantly either. He let us know right off uh, who was who and the way it was going to be. And he said, and I quote, Y'all are the sorriest looking shitheads I have ever seen in my life. He said, you better give your heart to God because your ass belongs to me for the next seven weeks. And he said, we're not going to have time for grab ass. This is exactly the wording that he used. And he said, so uh, we're going to get it over with right now. He said, so if anybody of you thinks that they're going to be able to whip me, he said, come on, let's go. And nobody made a move. And he said, well, he said, then how about a couple of you? And nobody made a move. And he said, well, you guys, come on. He said, come four or five of you, five or six of you, you know, and see if you can whip my ass or if you can't. And uh, nobody made a move. We didn't know what we were getting into, you know. And so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, that's the way it started. That was our introduction to boot camp. And he said, if y'all are hungry, he said, just forget that because you, you're too late. You should have got here sooner and then you could have had dinner, but you're not going to have any. So then he took us and you can imagine how pleasant it was. Uh, anyway, every day was like that. And uh, it consisted uh, mostly of marching, uh, but we had, I think, a couple of weeks there when we were at the rifle range, and that was at Linda Vista, California, which I understand now is all built up into housing and all that, but it was that community was just sand dunes at the time. And so we uh, were involved in that. And uh, I had a head start on most of the guys on the rifle because I had uh, at home when I was a kid, my dad bought me a rifle when I was 10 and told me it was to help put keep meat on the table. And we had a lot of cottontail rabbits in the area where we lived. And so I was taught the proper use of a rifle by my dad and not to ever point it at anything that you were not going to destroy. And uh, taught me not to shoot the rabbit with a shotgun because it fills them full of buckshot. And so you shoot them with a rifle and when you shoot them you don't just aim at the rabbit you aim at the rabbit's head and you shoot the rabbit in the head and so I got to where I could shoot a rabbit uh, they'll run about uh, 50 feet and they'll stop and look at you and that's when you shoot them and uh, so I got so I could shoot them right in the head and I was pretty good at it and so I had a head start there so I became an expert rifleman as a result of having attended the 
rifle range out there for a couple of weeks, but it was a different kind of rifle, of course. It was a 30 caliber. And it was, uh, we were the first platoon ever in the Marine Corps to get M1s. They had had O3s before that, for those of you who know the difference between those. But uh, anyway, the uh, uh, boot camp then was uh, pretty tough. Uh, we could not go to the PX. We spent our days, uh, oh gosh, from before daylight, we would get up. And when that bugle sounded, you better hit that floor and like the drill instructor said, hit that deck and hit it running, you know. And uh, boy, uh, it was just like that. And then he marched, had it all of standard attention out there, and he needed to march us over to breakfast. And we'd have breakfast. And then it was starting to get daylight, and now we go out and we march on the parade ground, and it was a mile long, and we'd... Uh, the most laps we ever ran on that was nine laps, so that's running double time, they call it, for nine miles. And uh, you're in pretty good shape. We were, I was all of us, I think, were in pretty good shape when we went into boot camp, but when we came out, we, we were really toughened up. And uh, during boot camp, uh, he... Uh, I remember one phase of it was uh, we had our bayonets and we had our rifles and they were not loaded but they had the bayonets on them and I remember him standing there in the sand and saying charge me with your bayonet and stick me you know and your natural tendency you don't want to stick the guy you really don't want to you want to get close but you don't want to do it but he said, oh, he said, you guys are pulling the bayonets. He says, come at me like you're going to kill me, you know. And uh, so then it's hard to do, but you can do that. And uh, he would, you find yourself down lying in the sand because he, there's no way anybody's going to stick that man with a bayonet. And he showed you how to, how to throw a guy who's approaching you fast running with a bayonet and you can do it and we could and we did at the time with each other that way so it was some pretty tough training for all that time so that's uh, all that uh, I'm going to say about that now when uh, at some point in boot camp we had to uh, take a lot of tests and do uh, give a lot of information about our background, things like that. So I filled in my background was all helping my dad overhaul cars in the garage and tractors, and I knew how to overhaul stuff. And so uh, that put me in a different category. And the top 10% of uh, our platoon was sent into aviation. Now, I don't know if which one, it probably wasn't, I probably was not in the top 10% otherwise, but I was in a category that they needed, and that was guys who were mechanical and could overhaul things. And so I was put into aviation also. So <clears throat> I i don't know, maybe my grades were up, I, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I did go into aviation. Now we had a choice of four places to go to, and uh, one of which was... Uh, Aircraft Metalsmith School at Norman, Oklahoma, and that is the one I chose and the one I was sent to. So I went there, and there were, uh, uh, I think, 2,200 Marines there. It was basically Navy. There was more Navy there than there were Marines. And uh, so we went to... Now, with my uh, welding background and my mechanical background, well, the welding background now, uh, I was uh, I took the training to be an aircraft metalsmith so, uh, and to weld aluminum, even if you couldn't get aluminum welding rods to cut strips and uh, use that for welding rods like you may have to do out on the islands at a later time, and stuff like that. Well, when I got out of there, <clears throat> went back to, oh, there's an incident that happened there at Norman, Oklahoma. 
I don't know about the statute of limitations, but I don't think uh, 60 years later would, uh, I don't think I'm in any trouble to tell this, but uh, there was a big old buddy of mine that I uh, buddied around with quite a bit. He was an Illinois boy too, and he was from down in the coal mines, and he was a tough hombre, and nobody messed with him. His name was Alexic, and we didn't even go by first names, we just went by, I call him Big Alex, and uh, it, when we were going to school, uh, the aircraft metalsmith school, well, we would uh, run as hard as we could over to the PX, which is, I guess, about a block away, and try to get in there before they closed, but they closed same time we got out of school, so uh, sometimes we made it and sometimes we didn't. And we wanted to get what in the Marine Corps you call a gee dunk, you know, which is ice cream or uh, malted milk, something of that nature. And so we were, we ran over there. Well, we were rejected there, and they didn't want us, and didn't let us come in. And so there was a couple of MAs, and we didn't get along with. Uh, they were Navy, you know. We didn't get along real well with them, and uh, they were. Uh, well, very insulting to us. And says, uh, I don't think they, I don't know if they cussed us or not, but uh, they said, uh, go on, get out of here, you know. What do you guys think you are? Some real obnoxious remark. And uh, Alex said something back to him. And so they both came running at both of us. And the one has got his club, and well, both of them's got the club. But one is behind the other, and he, this one in front, he goes right at Alex, but Alex busts him right in the nose and knocks him down. And I don't know if he's unconscious or not, because the other one came at me, and uh, nobody's gonna clobber my buddy, and I'm gonna stand there. I busted him too, and so we. Both busted both those guys, and they're lying down, and we ran like I never ran before into the darkness because everything is dark from there on, you know, out into the uh, barracks. We went into the barracks, and we were scared to death. I have never been so scared in all my life because I don't know what is coming. The fact those guys were armed, and I was afraid when we were running, afraid that uh, they were going to shoot us because they had 45 automatics on, and they probably couldn't see us very far away. But anyway, we jumped into bed, and I told Alex, I said, don't even take off your clothes. We had dungarees on, and I said, don't even take off your clothes. You know, just cover up and act like you're sleeping. And so he did, and I did too. And they lingered at my bunk there for a little while and looked at me in. And with them, uh, the group, well, I didn't tell who it was. It was, uh, I know there was a Marine lieutenant in there. And I, uh, with, there was a couple of Navy officers. I didn't know who they were. And they lingered there while I, they, they had no idea what I was going through in that bunk. And then the, they missed, they didn't couldn't identify us because they're looking at a uh, hundred guys or more in there. And so the next morning then they had all the Marines fall out of attention, every Marine on the base, 2,200 of us. And so we all stood in ranks there and these guys went up and down those ranks, up and down those ranks, and they couldn't identify us. Now if they looked at our knuckles, <laughs> so I don't think they tried very hard. And I, uh, I didn't tell this for a lot of years, but I don't think uh, there's any problem uh, 60 years later. <laughs> but we got by with that, but we didn't get by with the f avoiding the fear that comes with such a thing, because that would be a court-martial, and that would be probably the end of our military careers, and it would uh, be a very damaging thing to your life. And so uh, we got by with it. Then uh, completed that, I was sent back to Miramar and uh, put into a squadron. Or uh, I was sent from there up to El Toro, and uh, we were one. Uh, we were in the first group of Marines that got to El Toro. There was uh, nothing there, but uh, 
it was a base that was just established and there, there were no uh, permanent barracks and we slept in some uh, sheds that they had drug there and uh, at night and we were in the middle of bean field. There was bean field between us and the highway and when uh, we could get liberty there and uh, for the first time and so we were able to go into L.A. whenever we wanted to but uh, we had to walk a mile across the bean field to get over to the highway to get there and over to Tustin and Tustin was a gas station and a, a grocery store I think and uh, maybe two or three houses. I guess it's a city now, but uh, anyway, that's the way it was then. And so then, uh, a short time later, after being put into the MAG, that's Marine Aircraft Group, we were uh, <clears throat> now uh, going to be shipped overseas. So we took, we were put on a troop train and transported up to Oakland, and uh, we boarded the Essex aircraft carrier and we went uh, over to Pearl Harbor on the Essex. Well, we didn't know where we were going actually. And uh, right beside us was another uh, aircraft carrier of that class. And I believe it was the Yorktown, but I'm not sure which it was right now. But uh, we zigzagged all the way over there. So it took us several days to get over to uh, Pearl Harbor. And uh, so then we went to EVA, Marine Air Base, there. And uh, <clears throat> we were placing some other Marines who were leaving there and going where I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> we had a lot of uh, things that were damaged, I say things. I'm talking about aircraft and, and uh, <clears throat> trucks and jeeps and stuff that had to be repaired. So our job was repairing those because we were a service squadron and so I was uh, put to work. Oh, I was assigned a machine shop trailer at the time which had uh, arc and acetylene welding which I could operate both of those and having grown up in my dad's automotive garage and uh, working on cars, well, I could uh, work on all that stuff so uh, I could operate everything in that uh, machine shop trailer so I was the kind of guy they were looking for to repair stuff. And uh, of course I was uh, amongst other fellows who were uh, repair type guys and uh, so that's what our squadron consisted of and they kept us there for 13 months at, at EVA. Now that's pretty good uh, duty when you consider there's a war going on and some of the other islands not very far away from there. And so then um, in uh, about 13 months I believe it was we were sent over to Midway Island and uh, so I spent the rest of my time, no not the rest of my time, I spent uh, I don't know a year or so over there at Midway Island. And it's, uh, I remember the uh, Goonie Bird detail over there. There's so many Goonie Birds over there. The, the Lace Albatross is the correct name for them. But uh, every morning when, for example, when the Dawn Patrol took off, there were so many dead Goonie Birds that got hit because you just couldn't keep them off the runways. And they liked that warm asphalt, I guess, or whatever, from the day, still warm from the day before. But anyway, they would have a truck that went out. One guy drove the truck, and the other guy threw the dead guinea birds up on the truck. And then the airplanes came in a lot of times with the guinea bird in between the uh, cylinders of a radial engine. They were pretty well cooked, pretty well messed up. So uh, uh, then. Um, we were, uh, I was uh, assigned, I couldn't, they didn't have any machine shop trailers out there. And so I, uh, they wanted me as a welder because I had extensive welding schooling and uh, experience. And so I didn't do very much, probably no mechanical work at all on Midway as I had done quite a lot on uh, Oahu when we were there. So, they gave me, uh, I didn't have any shop, I, uh, they supplied me with some welding facilities. And so I went to, I had to find my, find my own doggone shop, you know. I, I went uh, in the blackout hangar there on Midway. I went to uh, the 
Marine sergeant who was in charge of the back portion of the hangar where they didn't keep airplanes. Uh, there was room for cars in there and you could overhaul uh, trucks and jeeps and stuff like that. So uh, I asked him if I could have a corner in there someplace for a welding shop because I needed someplace to weld. He said, boy, can you? He said, we'll, we'll be using you from time to time anyway. You know, yeah, I'd like to have you here. So I had me a corner of the welding, or a corner of the, uh, well, the back part of the, uh, of the hangar there. Uh, during the time that I was there, there was something that uh, was incredible that happened there, a couple of things. And uh, one of them was, uh, I think that's where I was, uh, but I was out walking on the beach one day, and I heard an airplane engine go to that terrible peak that RPMs that they reach when they're out of control and coming in. You know they're going to crash when you hear that, that sound. Few people have ever heard it, probably. But anyway, I heard that pitch of sound, and... Uh, so I looked up and I see this fighter plane and, and it's one of ours that is coming directly at me and I don't know which way to run. So I had my choice of about 360 degrees and so I, so I started running. Well, it hit about 100 yards away from me or less and uh, right, the pilot tried to get out of that thing but he didn't make it and uh, the canopy fell right closer to me than what the accident or where he bored into the sand airplane pilot and, and the whole works and uh, so then the canopy fell and then the his goggles fell i remember that and uh, his canopy and the, and the goggles fell <laughs> within about 30 or 40 feet of me so I remember that very vividly and also now one day uh, there's one of the guys who had uh, he said he stole it well uh, to steal a truck there it merely means is getting a truck on this island that's one and one eighth mile long you know and, and uh, to, now he's got a truck that uh, he calls his because it didn't have a it wasn't assigned to anybody at the time. And so he brings it over and he said, Bill, will you put a hitch on this thing for me? Uh, which was a pintle type, pintle type hitch for those who know what that is. But uh, anyway, so I, uh, I said, yeah, but I'm so busy, you know, in my shop. Oh, I really put in some hours in that shop because we had a lot of stuff to repair stuff that had gotten hit in combat and stuff that had rusted out and everything else. And uh, we couldn't even get mufflers and I even had to invent a uh, kind of a muffler of my own design to go on uh, to replace all the mufflers that were uh, uh, just rusted out and the salt water takes a heavy toll on those. And so they, <clears throat> I invented a new type of muffler and I was also very busy building that new type of muffler that would not rust out, made them out of conduit. So anyway, uh, I was uh, working in, the, in my shop there one day on this uh, truck. I, I stayed and didn't go to lunch that day so I could work on that doggone truck. And so this other guy and I were in the blackout hangar there. And the rest of them had all gone to town. And there was a couple of mechanics in the airplane part of that hangar. But I don't know what happened, and nobody ever found out exactly. But as the dawn patrol came in, they were F4Us, the, the uh, Corsairs. And as that patrol came in, the major's right hand wing, they always made a, a pass over the, before they came in uh, to make their approach. And the major's right hand wing man, as they made the pass over at about 5,000 feet, something like that, he uh, all of a sudden just went over, forward, and down, almost vertically, straight down, and came right dead center into that hangar. 
Well, he hits with such a terrible impact in his ammunition load and gasoline and I don't, he didn't have a bomb on board like they carried sometimes. Uh, anyway, that stuff went all over. Uh, this fellow and I are there and I'm welding this uh, hitch onto this truck. And all of a sudden, this, well, it uh, amounted to an explosion to us. Now, it blew all the siding off the doggone hangar, almost all of it out, and just left a skeleton there. And so, it, uh, I guess it blew me outside. Uh, it blew me about 30 foot out of, uh, from where I was because that's where I found myself and he was out there too. And I don't think I ran out there because I don't think I, uh, I think it all happened too fast for me to do that. But I do know that I was, <laughs> where I had uh, would been working was about 30 feet from where that, airplane came through and went through the cement of the floor and then went nine feet into solid coral rock below that because that's what midway is it's coral rock no dirt <coughs> so uh, anyway that was uh, kind of close there was a uh, vertical column between me exactly between me and where that airplane augured in. And there was a two before wired against that column and I don't know what the purpose of the two before was, but it was there. And later on I picked out a 50 caliber bullet, hit the steel column there through the two before and into the steel column was still stuck in the two before I had to dig it out that was exactly halfway, or not halfway, but it was exactly between me and where that went in. So I figured that's the one that would have gotten me if it hadn't been for the steel column. So I, I don't know, I was just being protected all around there. <laughs> so, uh, I didn't have a very exciting career because I was repairing everything. And whenever there was a uh, fleet getting ready to make a uh, beachhead someplace why we got it ready and we put uh, long hoses on the intake for the carburetor used uh, well a radiator hose material and extended them up about 10 feet above and we put cosmoline all over the engines so they could uh, be submerged and hopefully keep running you know and uh, get on shore with if they didn't hit a big rock or go in a hole or something so I, that's the way I spent my time on Midway Island. And uh, then we got orders that we were going back to the States. Went to the States and had my 30-day furlough in Illinois with my parents. And then my assignment was uh, North Carolina at uh, Cherry Point Marine Air Base in North Carolina. So uh, there I got assigned a machine shop trailer again. So I was happy back working with all the tools. They even had a lathe in there, you know, and they had all the power tools, had a generator on the front of it. So it was self-sustaining. And so I worked there and uh, all of a sudden they said that we had won the war. Now I was uh, at uh, I went to shore, everything just ceased. You, you just were on your own, you know. I went into New Bern. The North Carolinians called it New Bern, you know. <laughs> I went into New Bern. And uh, the streets couldn't even, cars couldn't even run on the streets. Uh, there was just Marines and sailors and... Uh, I don't, we weren't around much army, very, hardly ever, but uh, we were sometimes. And uh, I remember there was, uh, well, we were always in uniform because during wartime you could not be anywhere and be out of uniform. So we were there in uniform, and I remember walking down the streets in New Bern, and 
all the civilians, everybody, hey, Marine, have a drink. You know, everybody's got a drink. And if I had had as many drinks as I was offered, I wouldn't be able to hold it. But I did get drunk. And that was one of two times in my life that I've been that way. <laughs> and the other time was on Midway. <laughs> uh, I uh, got sleepy, and I crawled into the back of a pickup truck that was parked at the curb to kind of have a nap and sleep it off because I couldn't even go anywhere the way I was. And so I went to sleep and the next morning I woke up and I'm still in that pickup truck and I'm just about frozen to death because I've been in there all night. And uh, the pickup truck though has moved and I guess the guy probably was drunk that moved the pickup truck and it was out of house and I didn't know where the heck I was. Uh, I was out in the country someplace and uh, at this house. And that house was, uh, well, I didn't know which direction it was to town. There was a road out there, but uh, I didn't know which direction to start hitchhiking on that road, and there weren't any cars anyway. So I went out to the road, and I'm still trying to figure it out because it's early in the morning as the sun was coming up. And I never did find out who drove that truck, or, but uh, I guess that was his home. So a car finally came by, it was a pickup truck, and uh, he, you couldn't stick your thumb out anywhere and not get a ride if you had a uniform on back in World War II. And so <laughs> I stuck my thumb out and he picks me up and I, I said, I hope you're going toward New Bern. He said, I am. And I said, all right, I appreciate this. And so I rode into New Bern one, and that was kind of my experience on uh, VJ. And so that's, uh, well, after the war was over. Earlier I mentioned uh, having been a steam fitter welder's helper before I went into the service. And uh, when I got out, uh, when I was discharged and went home, uh, where I lived, there was no uh, steam fitters uh, local. Uh, there at all, and so I uh, I wanted to get back into construction because it paid well, and I had the ability to work up high, and uh, it didn't bother me, and uh, so I didn't have any fear of the heights. So I went to the iron workers local, and uh, I asked the business agent if I could talk to him a little bit. So he said, uh, sure, when I get through here. So I appreciate it. He says, okay, what do you want, son? And I said, well, I said, I'm looking for work. I, I said, I, uh, uh, I'm a certified welder. And I said, I can weld with any of them. And I said, do you need any welders? And he said, yeah. But he says, tell me about how high you've worked, how, how you have worked up high, and tell me all that, you know. I said, all right, sir. I worked on the largest steam powerhouse in the world. And uh, for two years, I was on that job working on the beams and stuff. Oh, <laughs> all of a sudden it changed. He put me to work. I went to work on a powerhouse and uh, welding. And uh, so that uh, went very well for me. I uh, was in the iron workers then for... Uh, I became a journeyman iron worker and uh, stayed with that for about six years, seven, about, I don't know, six years, I think. But anyway, and then I had to work all over the country because uh, the biggest thing that I did, I worked for Bethlehem Steel, and the biggest thing I did was to build a bridge across the river at uh, St. Louis, uh, which is the Veterans Memorial Bridge, which is since been renamed the Martin Luther King Bridge. So I had a hand in that all the way through, all the way across. <laughs> so then um, later on I did something that was totally not, uh, turtle, totally unrelated. I became a police officer in Los Angeles and uh, did a whole career there of 20 years as a police officer. My uh, career consisted of being a uh, motorcycle officer patrolling freeways is mostly what I patrolled and 
So I had did that. Uh, I consider that my career because I was on that longer than anything else. And then I've done related work to that. After that, I was a special deputy U.S. marshal uh, for uh, oh about six years, I guess it was. After that, uh, here uh, nearby in Sacramento, I live at Grass Valley or Nevada City right now. And uh, so I was, uh, also I worked for Kenny Rogers, the uh, singer. I worked for him as a bodyguard for him. Uh, that required a police officer's uh, training. He required that. So I worked for him for two years. And so that's my whole, most of my life. Oh yeah, yeah, I write. I have a book uh, that is coming out next month. It's called Code Two and a Half. And it's going to be introduced in Las Vegas. So I'm going there for that. And that's the 20th of uh, April. And uh, so uh, it's not easy to publish a book. I had, uh, it took some doing to get that book published, but I finally was able to do it. So I'm looking forward to that at the present time. I do a lot of writing. I wrote for one publication for, Thirteen years, I wrote for a police publication when I was on the police department for four years. I just uh, don't know why. I just like writing. <laughs> so I do a lot of that. I've been all kind, a lot of different types of writing, too. So that's it. That's where I am. The music, yeah, I've always uh, started out when I was a kid uh, playing my brother and I uh, guitars and banjos and fiddles and things and so I've always uh, done that and uh, well except it was a long time I didn't do it but I am back to it and uh, I play in a band now here locally and uh, it's uh, oh, something I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm.